Thank you very much, Rick, and thank you, Ryan, for a great presentation. I learned a lot, and I think you illustrated uh, so nicely why three-dimensional evaluation and planning is so important for patient sa safety. And I wanted to share uh, with the audience and the doctors present online some tips on how we can use uh, 3D planning to better place our implants more accurately, more precisely. And if the doctors online would like to have all my lecture slides for this presentation, all they need to do is go to my website, surgicalmaster.com, and basically download the slides as they are, and uh, feel free to contact me uh, after the presentation. So CT scan for planning has been around um, quite a long time, and it was excellent in order to evaluate bone quantity and identify different anatomical structures, even in the analog world, like Dr. Uh, Kazami mentioned. In the analog world, we were still able to evaluate the different spaces and the nerves and all the different structures we have to be uh, aware of. And I agree that the analog world and the analog systems did work uh, quite well, and we had very little complications uh, in terms of uh, safety because the positioning of implants was done more for more where the bone was, more uh, surgically oriented, more anatomically oriented rather than restoratively. And once we were able to improve our grafting techniques in terms of the hard and the soft tissues, uh, we were able to plan implants and execute implants that are better from a restorative point of view as well. So the ability to graft efficient ridges uh, was greatly enhanced, and we uh, typically used to create a wax up that uh, not only uh, tells us where the ultimate restoration would be, but also uh, how much tissue is missing so we can plan for that. And we've been doing this for years and years and years, and it, it worked quite well. And the step after that was to take the diagnostic wax up and create a radiographic guide that has got aperture markers that indicate the ideal implant trajectory for a, a good restoration, but also uh, show us where the missing tissue would be by using an acrylic with uh, a radio opaque material like barium sulfate. So our patients would wear these guides and be scanned with them, and we would obviously see these guides um, and these uh, got aperture markers uh, in the scan. We, we, we would see where the soft tissues are and what's the ideal implant trajectory. And then similar to Dr. Kazami's case, we would see that actually this trajectory is impossible and cannot be done because there is a significant deficiency like a concavity. And all my intention was to take the radiographic guide and convert it to a surgical guide and we now see it's not possible. So there was some type of restorative surgical disconnect. And unfortunately, many times we had to take the radiographic guide that was fabricated based on restorative parameters, and we had to toss it away. And we had to think something else and definitely not use it. All of that has changed by using computer-guided uh, implant planning and implant surgery, where we can take all the anat anatomical factors uh, include the restorative factors, combine them in one file, in one virtual patient file, make all of our decisions pre-surgically, and get much better results as it was uh, shown by uh, the previous presenters. Uh, thank you for mentioning all these points. And now we can place an implant in the best restorative position, but also in the best anatomical position and we have, again, the restorative surgical connection, and that works so much better. So I'd like to share with you three tips in regards to this process, and I picked uh, three tips for, of the different phases in, in, this, uh, in this process. One has to do with the acquisition of data that we need uh, for the planning. I'm going to talk about some of the um, accuracy issues. I'm going to talk about a tip that has to do with planning the ideal implant position and also give you one surgical tip and 
by the way, these tips, I made um, multiple mistakes, and I've seen doctors uh, fail in these areas, and I'd like to make it, make it very uh, useful and practical to you, so I hope this is going to be very, very helpful. So I'm going to start with uh, digital data. Uh, the implant world now is uh, mostly digital, all the way until we print a guide where it becomes uh, an actual device, and the idea behind it is take your conventional CBCT data in uh, a, a data set that is in DICOM images and merge it with the patient's model. And that could be an actual accurate model. It could be an optical scan. Both are fine. The emphasis is on accuracy. The more accurate you are in the data acquisition, the better your CT scans are, the better the resolution, the more accurate the impressions. Again, physical impressions and optical impressions the better the outcome because the accuracy or the lack of is going to trickle down all the way into the surgery. So the idea is to take the STL data, which is the optical, um, the, uh, optical scan or the digital, digital scan, and merge it with the DICOM data. And once we have that, we can start our implant planning and taking all the different factors into account. So. One of the problems, and Rick mentioned it initially, one of the problems that I see, and I used to do the same, uh, we jump immediately into the implant site. We start to identify the soft tissue outline. We analyze the rich quantity. We look at the wax up online or a, a virtual wax up, and we start planning the implant. And the first tip of, uh, of my presentation is before you do that, make sure that the sets of data, data were merged properly because if they're not merged properly, what you're doing, you're, you're planning an implant position and that would lead you to the wrong placement because the data sets are inaccurate. So one way is first of all to take uh, good impressions. We don't take alginate impressions anymore. We, we use PVS, uh, silicon material, or optical scans which are ideal. And we actually don't go into the implant site. I go and pick a different tooth as long as the patient has teeth. And I look at the anatomical outline of the CT scan and I see how the merge is seen here in the blue line. I also make sure that the um, merge follows the soft tissue. You can see the soft tissue uh, is outlined by a blue line, which means uh, it's quite accurate. And I would do it for a few areas and I would make sure that the uh, data sets are met, merged properly. Like on a premolar, you'd like to see the merge all the way into the central groove, and we can see this is quite accurate. Now, occasionally, and that happens sometimes with partial scans or if the uh, data itself uh, was distorted, we may see a discrepancy. And that's something that you'd like to catch before you plan the case, before you execute the case, because uh, your guides will fit, even if the data sets were not merged properly, the guides will still fit, but your implant will be in the wrong position. And sometimes it can be detrimental, especially if you're dealing in, uh, with the aesthetic zone in narrow spaces and close to anatomical structures, you will go in the wrong direction. So all this work would be in vain. Uh, another type of scan that is problematic uh, are patients that have previous implants or metal restorations with obviously the scatter and many times the, um, the uh, merge cannot be done properly so I would encourage you to explore other ways. It's still doable but you may need to use uh, a scan appliance with uh, radiographic markers and there are different ways to merge and I would encourage you to study how this can be done. Those markers need to be placed in a position uh, that avoids the scatter. It's a little bit complicated for uh, a 15 minute presentation but there are ways to do that. So tip number one is make sure that the data sets were merged properly and check that first. And only after you do that, you can start planning your case, ordering your guide, printing your guide like Rick does, and uh, having a, a great surgery and a very, uh, very accurate and precise. So once you have a good data set, set you're, you're, uh, you can actually go ahead and plan your implant and take all these considerations into account and there's a lot to learn about implant planning. There are a lot of uh, rules, there are a lot of recommendations, and things that we are actually learning as we go. But a very common 
uh, implant dilemma that I've seen uh, many times in my teachings and learning myself is when you're placing an implant or you're planning an implant, would you place it uh, perpendicular to the occlusal plane or would you place it more parallel to the adjacent roots? And of course, pros and cons for both options. And uh, interestingly enough, uh, I did um, quite a bit of informal research in the online community and among the doctors and students that I teach. And I was asking a lot of the surgeons, prosthodontists, lab technicians, and very experienced den dentists in implant surgery and, and in restorations, what is the best position? Is it, more, is it better to place an implant perpendicular to the occlusion or more parallel to the roots? And I was expecting to get a very definitive answer because um, you know, implant dentistry has been in, in the United States for um, over 30 years. And I thought this question was ans answered. And interestingly enough, after researching the the, the, there was no definitive answer you know, among, among the experts, uh, I think, in the world, on the world stage. And that was really interesting for me uh, all the way until I, I created a four-part video series that talks about this implant dilemma, uh, including the survey of almost a thousand dentists. And if you are interested, you can check uh, the videos out on ViewMedi. They're all, they're all there. And eventually, I'll give you just the bottom line. Um, it was pretty close between those two options, uh, but eventually the majority uh, voted for placing the implant parallel to the adjacent roots for many reasons, and you'll, um, you'll, you'll hopefully see the videos and you'll see the conclusions, but the position of the implant has nothing to do with the roots. The position of the implant, at least in the mesiodistal dimension, Roots are not always parallel, the roots of the adjacent teeth. The implant position should be parallel to the adjacent teeth contact areas. And that's more of a restorative consideration for screw axis uh, positioning. Because when you plan an implant that is parallel to the contact areas, you have more optimal contact areas with your final restorations and better embrasure spaces. And my second tip for this evening is plan the implant trajectory parallel to the adjacent contact areas. So uh, one tip of planning among uh, probably 100 tips that um, uh, we typically share. So the 3D implant planning uh, should be proper in all three dimensions, mesial and distal, buccolingual, and of course in an apical coronal di uh, direction. And Rick mentioned the fourth dimension of time, and I'd like to add uh, a little twist on that the uh, fourth dimension in regards to implant positioning is actually timing. The timing of the implant is actually very, very important. And for the ones that are not 100% sure about what does timing mean, the timing of the implant means, uh, relates to the position of the platform, regardless of the implant position, around its axis. And that's really important. Of course, any position can be corrected with custom abutments. And my third tip of tonight is timing is everything. Timing is extremely important. It's obviously important when you're using stock abutments that are, uh, need to be angled or using multi-unit abutments for your all in four cases. The position of the platform of the implant around its axis is very critical for these situations. But for a more practical point of view, if you decided to prefabricate an immediate provisional, you're planning an immediate an extraction, an immediate placement, immediate provisional, and you're planning to prefabricate a provisional, timing will be critical because if your timing is improper, even slightly, your provisional will not fit and your, um, your, your work will be in vain. It will be uh, disappointing to you. So all of this can be accounted for when you're preparing your provisional. You will be using your computer guide. You'll use the fixture mount that will deliver the input into the site. It has to be a fully guided process. And once you plan your case, you should create a little notch that indicates the timing. So once this uh, case is completed, uh, most implant system, systems have a timing uh, dot or indication. And that needs to be aligned with the notch that was prefabricated. And what's going to help you is to align this notch 
and your implant will be in a, in a great position and your provision will fit perfectly. And it's relatively simple to do. Once you've completed your planning, you'll take your surgical guide, you'll take the mount that you use, you can do it in your office, provide an implant analog to your, uh, your technician, and they will prefabricate a provisional and will not forget to create a notch to allow you to align this um, implant. Uh, once you place it fully guided into position, so your provisional will always fit perfectly. It's just a very, very uh, quick and practical tip. So my three tips for this uh, evening for this presentation, always check the data sets, make sure that they're merged properly before you plan your treatment. One planning tip is to plan your implant trajectory parallel to the adjacent teeth contact points for better embrasure spaces and contact areas with your final restoration, and the importance of timing and making sure your provisionals uh, fit quite well. So I thank you for your attention. The um, slides for this presentation can be again downloaded at surgicalmaster.com. Uh, I have a lot more videos that you can check out online. And the, this upcoming Monday, it's 5 o'clock uh, Pacific time, I'm giving a webinar, a free webinar, uh, on the best implant flap designs. You can register through surgicalmasterwebinar.com. It's a free webinar. And I look forward to meeting you online on Monday. Thank you again. Uh, thank you, Dr. Simon, for a great presentation. Um, I do have a couple of questions for you. First of all, you mentioned that the uh, merging of the uh, optical scan to the CBC data, CT data has to be accurate and that you know, your guide will still fit. So what's the best way of checking the guide surgically when you're actually starting to uh, uh, drill the site for the implant to uh, uh, you know, make sure that it actually is correct? Great question. So first of all, we need to make sure that the guide physically fits, that it's not rocking, and that it fits, number one. And it uh, most of the time fits extremely well. I still, even with computer-guided surgery, even with fully guided procedures, I always take a radiograph after my first uh, twist drill with um, a direction indicator, make sure I'm going in the right direction. I also use my brain and I see that the implant is the proper, goes in the proper direction. And if there's any challenge, it's better to detect it early on in the procedure and there's still room to make some corrections. And of course, the corrections uh, cannot be done computer guided. Excellent, excellent. Um, also, the other question that I had for you was, um, you showed actually placing a temporary restoration immediately. Um, what percentage of the time do you think that's possible uh, in, in your own practice? That's such a great question. Uh, actually, immediate provisionalization or placement, I uh, typically reserve it only, only for the aesthetic zone, number one. And uh, I would say it's probably less than 10%. Uh, I would say between 5 and 10% of all cases get immediately provisionalized when it comes to the immediate zone. And the considerations for that are um, there's a multitude of uh, reasons why we choose one versus the other. And it mostly has to do, and I'll talk about it more on Monday when I talk about the best implant flap designs, most of them have to do with deficient tissue and bone where if I'm placing an immediate provisional and I'm starting off with a deficient site, I'd like to have some additional opportunities uh, at the uncovering and at the placement uh, surgeries to enhance the soft tissue profile and enhance the bone. So uh, it's not a great majority. Thank you for the question. That, that's nice to know that even in Beverly Hills, you're not always uh, doing immediate temporization. Great. That's, that's the story with Beverly Hills. In Beverly Hills, the, I, I think the liability is much uh, greater. The aesthetic demands are quite high, and there's no tolerance for failure. So uh, in that sense, I think that explains the, um, you know, the conservative approach.